everybody, welcome to Insight Radio. I am your host, Danielle Agnew, and you are a fly on the wall to everywhere. I, I always think in my head, like, you know, those 1950s sci-fi movies, the beginnings of the night, that, that's, what, that's what it sounds like in my head. Anyway, how are you? How is everybody? How are you? How have you been dealing with all kinds of things out there? That have been a little old west. How are you faring in this time frame? You know, I hope you're doing okay and I hope you don't lose hope. Okay? I mean, I can't believe how many folks I'm seeing all over the place that are just losing hope. I mean, and it's bad. It's it's not good. It's bad. It's really pretty bad. And gang, I know that we know at the core of who we are, we know that we we have a lot to hope for. We know that. Yet what we don't know all the time is what's going to happen? What does that mean? Blah, blah, blah. We don't know what these things mean sometimes. We just don't. So I want to share with you some information that's been coming through the ethers to me about one of the reasons that we're experiencing so much ugliness right now in people. I mean, Man alive, I've got a really, really, really good friend of ours, uh, my wife and myself, and I, she's not even a friend. She's a family member. I have known this woman for 20, good Lord, seven years. Wow. A really long time. And she's she's family at this point, and we, we just love her. And she worked customer service for a long time in a particular industry. And really, not only did she get burnt out on that, and you know she was of retiring age anyway, Yet she noticed such a steep rise in how negativity in people had just spiked. And I mean, when you've worked customer service for some place for 10, 15 years, I mean, you know, you kind of you kind of got the clock on what, what a normal grumpy person's gonna be like or what a real ass hat's gonna be like, or you know, somebody having a bad day or whatever. And my friend was telling me just how just the level of rage and vitriol and how angry everybody got and whatever. And, you know, we talk a lot about the dimension of love and the dimension of fear and and really fear that we were in. Yet, I want to talk today about broken empaths and what happens when an empath who has had their heart broken, their identity broken, their spirit broken, generally it's their spirit broken, at a young age, I just want to talk about how some of that behavior manifests itself so that we can start to view people in a slightly different manner instead of, oh, that's that a-hole who peeved me off at the grocery store. Um, I mean, that happens and we have to process those feelings. Let's let's acknowledge that. Yet after, after that, after a while, when we start to look at the world and we're saying, what is wrong with everybody? Why is everybody acting so mad? You know, what is this about? Well, I, I deal in spiritual physics and I deal in core design. And that's how these angels speak to me, especially, you know, when I'm talking to, well, everybody. And so, you know, when we think about somebody having their spirit broken or something happening that breaks within, it's actually more identifiable to the angelic realm as starving empaths. You know, we as people think, wow, you're broken, you're acting weird. And it's not that we're broken because that means that there's something that's been severed. And and in the case of some of these people, there has been a lot that's been severed. You know, it could be sexual abuse. It could be physical abuse. You know, empaths enduring any kind of abuse, that can that can break us on any level. Yet really, the angels talk about starving empaths. They talk about the person starving. And it's so interesting to watch. It's interesting to watch. It's interesting to watch these angels talk about this stuff. So, what is a starving empath? What is a starving empath? Well, a starving empath is somebody who is not going to be able to feed themselves. And what does that mean? Well, 
Let's first talk about the gift of empathy. And I am seeing so many empaths come forward. I swear, I I sound like I'm just one of those weirdos who calls everybody an empath, and that's not actually true. I happen to meet with many empaths in my work, and I think I have a particular calling to be able to bring messages to empaths, you know, just like some people work in the area of mathematics or some people work in the area of rocket science. I seem to work a lot with healers, channels, you know, empathic individuals who are working on their gifts. That's just a lot of who I interface with. It's really interesting. So when we're talking about a starving empath, we're talking about somebody who doesn't know how to feed the heart chakra. And if you think about being an empath, what is it? Well, if you think about the heart chakra as a huge jet engine, and it's sucking in energy from the front, and it's pushing it out the back as fast as it can. And just think of how fast a jet engine propels that plane. So if you're an empath and you're listening to this, you have this discerning tool in your chest that's moving at the speed of a jet engine and even faster. It's sucking information through everywhere. And think about how much air is sucked through a jet engine. You know, one of the deals about a jet engine is it sucks so much air cubically so quickly through those turbines that it's the equivalent of a massive propeller on the front of the plane And that massive propeller would be working at a slower rotation, but those huge blades on that propeller are covering far more air to be able to create far more lift and power uh, over the airplane wing, right? So here you've got a jet engine in you. So it's small, it's compact, and it's working like a massive, huge propeller. You know, think Don Quixote, think charging charging one of those incredible, I keep wanting to say lighthouses, they're not lighthouses, windmills, because I think lighthouse, because empaths have such a bright heart chakra. So you've got this windmill-sized, giant windmill-sized turbine that's crunched down to the size of a jet engine that is moving energy through your heart chakra. And why? Well, because all that energy that moves through the heart chakra as it comes through the body, you know, our bodies are giant bags of salt water and electricity with a really interesting bone scaffold holding us up so we can wander about. And so we're a big bag of salt water full of electricity. Here comes this energy and it hits not only the heart, the lungs, but it hits the heart chakra and it hits our nerve relays. You know, we've got our nervous system that runs right up the back up the spine, gang. So here comes all this energetic information, and we begin to decode it at breakneck pace. So I want you to think of sucking in tons of strands of DNA, just tons and tons and tons and tons of DNA. And as you're sucking in these strands of DNA, your emotional and spiritual gift is to decode them. You are a decoder. Welcome to being a decoder. You're breaking down all of this information at breakneck pace. And then you're evaluating if you should respond. Should you react? Is this just a piece of information that you should keep for a rainy day? And you are doing this so quickly, so quickly, that you're not even thinking about it. A billion D times a nanosecond. Empaths, this is why you're tired at the end of the day. Not even kidding. And this process saps a lot of nutrients out of the bloodstream because it takes energy to run your heart, right? I had somebody ask me one time, that's crap. Well, it was a statement. That's crap. How can a spiritual gift use up resources from your body? It's spiritual. It has nothing to do with your body. Well, let me tell you how this works. Okay. Here's how it works. You know, obviously, if I'm going to go on a bike ride and I'm going to do that for 45 miles, I need to fuel my blood. I need to eat proteins. I need to eat carbs. I need to make sure that I've got enough iron in there so I don't fall asleep on the bike ride. I need to fuel the body. Well, why do I need to fuel the body? Well, because my heart's going to be pumping. My heart is an electromagnetic organ. Zero. Not only is my heart an electric mag- electromagnetic organ, so is my brain. So it, we empaths, I'm one also, we empaths 
are using up huge amounts of energy, just having this energy sucked through the heart chakra, you propelling the massive jet engine itself. We are using huge amounts of energy on that chakra spot. And yes, it's physical. And yes, we feel it in the body. How many of you empaths out there have ever walked into a room and just gotten sick to your stomach and you absolutely had no idea why? And there was not a gas leak. Okay. So you walk in and you just get sick and you just feel this heaviness in your chest. So your stomach is nauseated and your, your chest is compacted and heavy and tightening and your heart starts beating faster. Now, why is that? Why is that? Is it because you're crazy weak? Is it because you don't know how to hold yourself in public? No, that is not it at all. That is not it. Why that's happening is because you are feeling with your physical body the results of the empathic gift or the jet engine interfacing with the heart chakra, breaking down the DNA of energies in the room. And after you break down the DNA of those energies in the room, you are finding that many, many of those energies hold dissonance or chaos. And that dissonance and chaos, are you ready for this? The actual DNA of the dissonance and chaos hits the bag of water called the body, hits the nervous system, which is the fiber optic network of all things in the body, hits you like a ton of bricks, and your body doesn't feel good. So, yes, empaths, yes, having the gift of empathy is a very physical thing. You can feel it in your chest. You can feel it in your stomach. Sometimes you get headaches. You can feel it in your head because our fleshly spacesuit has sensors in it that say, danger, Will Robinson, danger, Will Robinson. When we were in a position to be in spiritual dynamics that just aren't good for us, and are going to compromise us, okay? So are you following me so far? Okay. So our blood gets all kinds of nutrients extracted from it to run our empathic gift. This is a thing. It's a real thing. Our blood is having all kinds of things zapped out of it in order to run the jet engine that is interfaced with the heart chakra, that is interfaced with the nerve system, which is again interfaced with our heart and our brain. Because our brain is the master computer that tears apart all of this uh, electrical impulse that our body has translated the spiritual information into. It's like the DNA, gang. The DNA, nucleus of the DNA, it's in the nucleus of a cell. The DNA cannot touch the flesh or it is destroyed by the vibration of the flesh. It's wrecked. It's dead. Because the flesh moves too slow and is full of toxins. So, in the same way that the DNA cannot touch the flesh, the empathic gift allows the body to have a physical reaction so we can understand the spiritual vapors in the air. Because otherwise, the body doesn't know how to react to that. Just like the RNA is the translator for all of the sacred holy information in the DNA, you know, the RNA has got to go in there, translate it, and come back out. It's like a rail line between the high vibration, the God vibration of the DNA and the nucleus, and the slower three-dimensional vibration of the flesh. So your DNA is 5D, and the flesh is 3D, and the RNA is the train that's allowed to cross the border. It has the right paperwork to get from the secret 5D underground bunker out to the 3D masses, okay? So, so, what are we talking about here, people? We are talking about the fact that once that RNA gets out into the flesh, it starts talking to the body about the information that the body needed from the 5D plane, from the DNA. And the only reason that the, the RNA is there is to translate that holy vibration or holy frequency, or I, I call it holy because it is. We, we, have a, we literally have a porthole to all creation in the nucleus of every cell in our DNA. 
It is fascinating. It, it blows my mind when I look at it. It's so cool. So the RNA's job is to make little protein strands in the cell. So the body that's working on 3D, it's a 2G signal. The body can understand what the DNA in its 5D energetic transmission is trying to tell it. Serious. So, so empaths. So we're going to switch over to the heart chakra and we've got this really cool jet engine and it's sucking in all this air and, and also electromagnetic energy. And it's also breaking down in our body what we're feeling. It's transmitting that energetically to our nerve regions, to our nerve system. The nerve system is going up to the brain and the brain's going, oh, wow, I happen to know that that guy's really sad over there and I have no idea why. So that's basically super duper cliff notes of how the gift of empathy works. And it does take lots of energy from the blood and empaths. If you're not eating enough protein, if you're not getting enough B12, B6, if you're not getting enough magnesium, if you're not getting enough iron, your body, it's going to start, your body will start eating itself in order to fuel this gift. So that's gross, but eat enough food. Okay, moving on. So here's the thing, okay? We see how this is all laid out. So what is a starving empath? What is a starving empath? Is it somebody who doesn't get enough B12 or B6 or magnesium or protein or iron? Well, probably, probably. Yet that's not what we're talking about when we talk about a starving empath. We're talking about an individual who is still receiving all this information through that heart chakra at breakneck pace that we talked about. Yet they have severe trauma in their life somewhere and it disrupts the distribution of the energies or allowing them to process the energies in a way that is not self-destructive or destructive to others. Okay? So we're looking at a mechanism of translation that's missing out of that individual. And it's missing because the gift of empathy is still working. It's still sucking in all this energy, yet that person's, their, their, their nerve system is still working properly. It's still trying to shove all this information in a parceled way up to the brain so the brain can make sense of the electromagnetic cloud that this person walked into in the crowded train station and they're trying to find their way through. Yet when it hits the brain, it hits a matrixing mechanism. Okay, so maybe the brain, uh, maybe this person was abused in public places. Maybe this person was abused on a train, whatever it is. Here comes all this spiritual information about the chaos that's out there. And now this person is heavily triggered because, oh my God, instead of just feeling the different diverse energies that this person is moving through, now what we've got on our hands is somebody who's heavily triggered. So instead of just going with the flow and decoding the information that's hitting the brain, which is what empaths do all the time, that's why we just know stuff about people. It just happens. It just, it, it's a, literally we are absorbing other people's energy, good or bad. Okay. It goes through us. Now it doesn't stay with us, but it goes through us. So we get a snapshot of what's going on. It's an insight mechanism. So a starving empath is somebody who all of this information is coming in yet they just aren't sure emotionally or intellectually where to put it. And again, generally we're talking about individuals who were heavily abused as children, emotionally abused, had love withheld from them. There's a million reasons addiction issues fall into the starving empath syndrome. So this person is, is receiving all this, you know, mechanism of energy, but they don't know what it means or what it is. And they don't know where to put it. And they don't know how to use it productively. It's just like being fire hose down. Somebody hitting you with the fire hose. So the, the, the overall arching everything here is that for starving empaths, the gift of empathy is massively overwhelming. Because again, you know, they haven't learned to kind of stand sideways in the stream. They're just getting mowed over like a, like a protester in the 1960s in the American South. I mean, they're just getting pushed across the parking lot with the fire hose and just whoosh, there they go. And that's what the gift of empathy ends up feeling like for them. So they try to shut it down. They try to 
do anything they can to protect the heart chakra or disengage from the overflow of information. A lot of starving empaths are drug addicts, they're alcoholics, they're rageaholics, they're workaholics. A lot of starving empaths um, suffer from severe depression because they're not sure how to utilize this mechanism, you know, this is a cheesy way to put it, but they're not sure how to use their Iron Man heart in their chest. They don't know how to use all that power, and they just don't know. So instead, they uh, they start to seek any kind of energy that can be directed at them on purpose. Now think about this dynamic. Why would they want that if they were already pushed across the parking lot by the fire hose of life, okay? Why do they want more because they get numb to the chaos that's pushing them across the parking lot. You know, if, if something's hitting you all the time, pretty soon you just kind of can't feel it anymore. Yet your gift should be picking that up. It should be going through you. You should be making connections with people. And that's if the, the gift of empathy is accessed optimally. We should be connecting with individuals, connecting with the world, connecting with animals. Empathy is a connection mechanism. And it's different than being empathetic. Because we can intellectually empathize with just about anybody. We can say, oh, I'm so sorry he lost his job. That just sucks. We may not physically feel something when we're talking about the job loss, but we'll intellectualize how inconvenient and awful and oh, and, we, and our heart might wiggle a little thinking, oh, that's so embarrassing to get fired. You can tell that the gift of empathy is engaged rather than being empathetic with somebody because the gift of empathy creates a very somatic response. It's a very physical response. Okay. So, you know, you might be watching something on the news and they're talking about kids being buried alive or something, and you get just hideously sick to your stomach. You have nerves that you can't even stand. You feel the absolute panic off of the kid they're talking about, and you turn the channel. That's my response that I have. I, and so in my work, I have found 250 million ways to divert that response when I'm, at, when I'm experiencing it if I'm volunteering for law enforcement. I need to divert that response because if I don't, then I can't do my job. I, I'm on the floor in a pile of tears, freaking out, feeling the victimization of that child. I have to be able to feel it, yet I have to be able to keep my bubble between the lines in order to report on it. So empaths that have worked with this gift since we were little kids, you know, we've just got a little bit of practice in how not to pretend it's not happening, how to acknowledge it, how to send it to the mail center it all needs to go to be able to extract the largest amount of information possible and to be able to be of assistance and then pass off what we don't need. And I'm not going to fib. I'm not a superhero. I have definitely... Worked on certain cases and then afterwards needed to have a cocktail with loving friends and just decompress because, wow, wow, what human beings are capable of. Yet in that moment, my job is to suck the information in, process it, and be able to articulate it. So a starving empath has no clue how to do any of that. They don't even have a clue that the fire hose has sent them across the, the parking lot and now they're pinned against the Piggly Wiggly getting just nailed with the fire hose and because it's happening to them all the time. Yet, they're not sure how to turn their heart chakra into that because they're trying to protect their heart chakra because they see the energy as the bully. So they're trying to feed their heart with some kind of connection in the middle of getting fire hosed and not knowing how to deal with any of that. Well, a starving empath, more than not, will resort to negativity to create a connection with another person. Because when somebody's angry at us, when somebody's screaming at us, have you ever had somebody just get in your face and just uncork on you to the point where you can't even stand it? That mechanism where that empath is feeling all of that negativity through their heart chakra, that is the point that they consider connection successful because, okay, so I know this sounds really crazy and who would ever think that somebody screaming in somebody else's face would make 
a difference to them emotionally. But think about it. You know, we in America, we we substitute drama for intimacy all the time. So if I'm a starving empath and I don't know how to productively angle my heart chakra into all of the energy that is coming at me, and the only way that I know how to direct energy into my heart chakra is to pick a fight with somebody and have them screaming at me that I'm screaming at them while well, I'm eating that. And now I'm not starving anymore because that is the mechanism through which I have achieved human connection. The bullying, the screaming, the people crying, you know, all of that, that horrible emotional duress that I've actually put down into another person. And then they're crying and yelling at me. Well, I'm just eating that up through my heart chakra because that's a connection. And, and I can, I can be desperate and screaming. And, and when I'm directing that desperation and that screaming energy at the other person and they come back at me either with tears or they come back at me and they yell or whatever happens, that is the empathic bridge I have allowed myself to feel because I'm so braced up on everything else. So a lot of starving empaths are people who are heavily narcissistic. Narcissists are the most starving empaths of all. They, they've got this big black hole in their chest. And no matter how much adoration you give them, no matter how much love you give them, no matter what you do for them, it's never going to be enough because that person doesn't know how to feed themselves productively with a productive figure eight type of energetic exchange. They just don't know how to do it. So it just becomes this great big, meltdown, basically, of more about me and more about me. And I'm going to berate you till it's about me again, because I need all I can do is hammer you till it's about me because I'm starving. Narcissists, sociopaths, you know, a lot of narcissists fall under the sociopathic exercise. And I don't think all narcissists are sociopaths, actually. I think a lot of narcissists have trained themselves to pout until people pay attention to them. And in the same way that women, and I see this a lot with men, actually, it's very interesting how we've, how we've really just twisted our genders in crazy directions in the United States of America. I mean, we have really role played it out in our gender identities. No wonder so many people and these younger generations are coming forward and they don't identify with either gender because we've put such a heavy stigma out there on what these genders are supposed to be, that how the heck is anybody going to identify with that coming into the new world? I know I wouldn't. I'd be like, yeah, I, I actually don't identify with that. And also, a lot of these younger kids coming in, or people who've been here on earth for a while, who were forced to pick a gender, a lot of these folks, their souls don't need the experience of identified gender. It's just not something that our soul needs. Our soul is not gender-based. Our soul is genderless. So when we have these children coming in, these young people, whomever it is, these adults who have been forced to live a gender in a body just because biologically that gender would be indicated, yet their soul is in here going, I am not jamming with this at all. Now, at least we have the beginnings of conversations about the not being non-binary and in your in your preferences or non-binary or non-gender specific about who you are, you know? They are them. So when I when I see this narcissistic tendency, I see it in women, definitely. Yet I see it a ton in males. And a lot of times we throw around the word narcissist like it's like everybody's a narcissist these days. Do you ever notice that? Oh, she's a narcissist. He's a narcissist. And I do think there is a psychological affectation that is narcissistic personality disorder I mean, that's a thing. That's a mental illness. That's a mental compulsion to make the whole world revolve around you. 
Yet a lot of times what I see with men and women is the narcissism energy is coming from starving empaths who do not understand how to make complete connections with others. So they throw these pouty fits and they rage like little inner five-year-olds if everything's not about them. And again, I've known lots of women narcissists, don't get me wrong. Yet I see with our males, because we have not given men a any sort of reasonable emotional support in who they are. We're supposed to dress them up like Superman and they're supposed to go be a provider, don't have any feelings, never ask for anything, never need any help, never need a break, supposed to work 80 hours a week, support the wife, the kids, everybody else, and be a superhero and be the guy who teaches Little League. And uh, somehow these men uh, apparently are supposed to operate on some operating system that I've never even heard of, which is no sleep, selflessness, Oh my God. And in the middle of that, you're supposed to have no emotions about anything. Guys, that's bull crap. And I don't know where that crap came from, but I'm sorry it got laid on you because literally men, men's strength is in their deep ability to be empaths. Men's strength is in their beautiful purity in how they love. Men's strength is in their dedication to what they love and to community building. And their strength is in their tears and their strength is in the breaking down when something hideous has happened to someone they love. This is where men's succeed. But there's nothing about the the imbalanced patriarchal time frame that gives a framework for this. So our gentlemen, many times, and we'll get to what make women narcissists in just a minute, our gentlemen will take off in these bizarre ways where they feel like they can't ask for what they need. So they have to bully it out of somebody, or they have to pout it out of somebody, or they have to slam doors and silent treatment and act like the little boy the little boy who's collapsed in on himself and he doesn't have mommy's approval, you know, and then it, then, but then it comes out in a man. So then you've got all the raging and the anger and the, the problem with you is, and that was done to that male, most likely by their father. Not always. Sometimes it's done by the mother. I'll tell you, I see a lot more twisted up fellas who have had narcissist mothers. Uh, that makes narcissist fellas a lot. So, you know, women narcissists tend to be, and again, these are people who are huge empaths who don't know how to properly feed the heart chakra with healthy human connection. That's a narcissist. Literally, there there are connectors in there that are flat broken. Like there's something in there that's just not working. It's saying, no, thank you. I can't quite make this work. So women narcissists, when it has to be all about them, that's the person generally who is ignored as the child. That's the woman who was told who has zero self-esteem. They were told they were not good enough. A lot of times those are women who were sexually abused. So their, their intrinsic sense of self is out the window because it's been compromised at such an early age. So these women walk around and they start demanding that everything's about them and they are eating the dedication of their followers at that point through, you know, they, they, a narcissist can all f- shower you in positive attention when they want you to love them back. But the minute it's not coming the way they want it or fast enough, or it's not all about them, they freak out because they're a starving empath. Okay. So women narcissists, then they go stomping around and withholding sex from their partners and it's all got to be about them. And they make, you know, they, they generally can have low hanging sexy. So they've got sexy hanging out there and then they create this fervor of people trying to achieve partnership with this person who then turns around and treats them like dirt and it's all got to be about them. And women can be narcissists in a very indirect way also. Men tend to be very, very direct narcissists because they are starving empaths and they don't know how to ask for what their heart chakra needs. And women tend to be very, they can be very indirect narcissists, like passively, aggressively guilting people into doing what they need or being the martyr or the hypochondriac where everything is about them and everybody needs to bend over backwards and make it be about them. So because of our gender roles and how twisted up, we've made the caricature of the damsel who needs to be saved, which is crap, ladies. We don't need anybody to save us. That's stupid. Good Lord, we push babies out of our hoochie. 
I mean, come on. We propagate humanity. I, I think we're pro- I think we're pretty good. I think we got this, girls. What we want is we want exquisite partnership, and we want to be able to melt into our partners. We want to be able to know that that partner has us, and a, a gender nonspecific has us in their arms, has a strong back, a strong set of shoulders, a strong, you know, emotional and moral compass. That's what we're looking for. We don't need to be saved. However, all of humanity needs to be saved from itself once in a while, and that's called a good friend group who kidnaps you, takes you out to dinner, and you have a good friend game night that night that you weren't expecting. That's that's a healthy way to be saved from the self. So as we can see, you know, the male narcissist, the female narcissist, we have a president who exhibits unbelievable narcissistic behavior shamelessly in the media. Um, and also, well, and there's some other stuff. There's a lot of other stuff going on with our president. However, that's a starving empath. You know, the reason that Donald Trump has even been able to remotely maneuver in any way, shape, or form, um, it, it honestly is because the guy is a huge empath. He can feel where he can appeal to people. And people who've met him in real life are like, oh my God, that is the nicest guy I've ever met. He made me feel like a million bucks. He made me feel like I was the center of his world, which is also a narcissist thing, but it's also an empath thing, right? So what we've got is our commander in chief is a fantastic walking, talking, breathing example of a starving empath. Oh my gosh. Poor Donald Trump. I mean, he can't get enough money. He can't get enough fame. He can't get enough controversy. He can't pick enough fights. This guy is an insatiable black hole of absolute self-hatred and insecurity and just not knowing how to suck in that energy in the heart to make it actually be productive. He appeals to his base in these bizarre speeches, which in include a lot of really odd comments about putting other people down, people of color, people with disabilities. I mean, just really odd stuff just to get the crowd to roar. You know, build the wall, build the wall, roar. He's eating everybody. Okay. He's a starving empath. That guy's so starving. You know, a lot of times starving empaths too, They can have eating disorders. Again, they can be drug addicts. They can be alcoholics. And poor Mr. Trump, if you've not noticed, has gained a ton of weight since he's got into the presidency because that guy is shoving McDonald's in his face as fast as he can to try to fill that hole on the inside. You know, and it's really funny because as machismo as Donald Trump likes to act, Donald Trump has a lot of absolutely unbelievably repressed female energy in there. That poor guy has choked out his female chi and just like put it in an Iron Maiden and dropped it underwater in the vast underwater caverns of his self-denial. I mean, seriously, he is so out of touch with what he is, and he's so hungry. I mean, can you imagine somebody with Donald Trump's charisma who was actually in touch with their empathic ability? Can you imagine that? I mean, wow, you would have somebody who had all this charisma, all this ability to get out there and be a front guy, and then the ability to connect with people, the ability to know where people were at, yet the desire to actually come into communion with others, not just to feed the self, which is what he's all about. That's why he's on Twitter all the time. That's why he's on Twitter. He's eating the energy that comes back off of all those tweets, even if people hate him. He's eating that energy. And here's the thing, here's the thing you may not know, is that if you're a public person, especially somebody who is in a political position, and you are stewarding that many people, you energetically hook up to that person whether you want to or not. And I felt that even when I was running for mayor, I was just a candidate, and I could feel 140,000 people in the surrounding Billings, Montana area hook up to me. I could feel their wants, their desires, their needs. It was huge. It was heavy. It was big. It was exciting. And that's only Montana. 
So imagine if you're the president. Imagine if you're the most starving empath alive, and here you finally achieved the presidency and you didn't really want that job. But then while you were there, you learned that it was an all-you-can-eat buffet of attention, energy, and actually a lot of rage, which is one of the reasons he says all this outlandish junk. Because the more outlandish junk that he says, the more people freak out at him. All these people are energetically connected to him, and he eats. And he's still eating. That man is so at risk for a heart attack. You know, and that doctor that said he was fine, he was perfectly healthy, he was this, he was that, that's crap. He is not healthy. You know, we've got a starving empath in the Oval Office. And he is so, his connections are so broken within him as to what makes him truly happy. He doesn't even know what makes him happy. He's just running from one rush to the other. And most starving empaths do run from one rush to the other because they haven't slowed down long enough to understand that what's going to fill them up is true human connection, is selfless service to another person. And our poor president, I keep saying our poor president because everybody's like, how can you even say that? He's a horrible person. He's, he's, he deserves terrible things. Well, I can say that, gang, because I can see inside of this human being. And he is a human being. And he was a human being that had unbelievably awful emotional, <sighs> I can't even put it into words. He grew up in an emotional vacuum. He grew up raised by a narcissist. He grew up... I think raised by two narcissists when I look at both of his parents. And, you know, they just took turns going back and forth about who it was going to be about. And he just was not, I mean, here's this very sensitive person who was, who had learning disabilities that fell in the cracks of never being able with, with a lot of feminine energy of never being able to be the dad. You know, Donald Trump has siblings. We never hear about them. Because, you know, like when you have the dysfunctional family and you hear about the whole dysfunctional family, but you don't really hear about the siblings very often. It's because the siblings don't have a whole lot to do with the family because they've gone on and made their lives functional. Okay. So the reason I say poor Donald Trump is because I, I, that, I, cause I feel that way. I feel that way. I, I cannot believe what I, what I see inside of that man at 72 years old, and he's still just languishing under the wounds of the ignored seven-year-old and the ignored five-year-old. And the kid was made fun of because he couldn't read fast enough. I mean, he's got a learning, he's got a visual learning issue. And, but he, man, he managed to bluff his way through because of his great gift of empathy. He can feel people. Yet look at how it got twisted up. So a starving empath, here's, here's the, tough about, the tough thing about a starving empath. A starving empath can become unstarving. They can decide to try and, like the Grinch, have their heart grow three sizes that day. They can choose engagement. They can choose, choose selfless behavior. They can do all of it. Yet it's challenging to get them to see that that's A, what they need, and B, the other part that's challenging is to get them to just open the floodgates on their heart. Because let's go back to that person who is being fire-hosed across the parking lot, pinned against the grocery store wall, still just getting fire-hosed. And then you're asking them, well, can you just open your heart chakra? Just open your heart Open your heart to everybody who loves you. We love you from above. We love you from below. You know, that person's not going to want to open their heart chakra when they feel like they're getting the crap kicked out of them by life. Okay? So when we talk about narcissists, when we talk about starving empaths, I actually draw a line between a true narcissist and a starving empath. Because when I look at the starving empaths, they can exhibit narcissistic behavior. Yet they are too busy feeling many, many levels of remorse, insecurity, fear. Um, A true narcissist is they feel anger, rage, betrayal, and they're just hungry all the time. And they're generally, they generally have no, they feel joy when it's all about them. 
yet they they don't really have that peace going, God, I hope people like me. I hope people like me. A true narcissist doesn't give one rat's butt who likes them because they are the top of their world. And I guarantee you our commander-in-chief, our starving empath-in-chief, our starving empath-in-chief worries constantly that people don't like him. Not that he can't eat off of them. Not that he can't just, you know, come down with a narcissistic hammer and feel better once he gets what he wants. He is terrified that he will be starved out, that he will be not important anymore, that he will lose his connection to be able to eat off of everybody's adoration and energy, that he will starve. Now, I'm going to change gears a little bit to the Stephen King movie called It. Have you seen It lately? You need to watch It because the creature in It is fear. And if fear is not fed, then it starves. So every so often fear comes out of the gutters and takes on this creepy, you know, persona. I don't want to spoil it too much for you. And has to feed itself because its greatest fear is starving. Think about that. So we've got our starving empaths and their greatest fear is starving. So they create fights. They create Twitter wars. They create anything they can where even the negative attention is energy coming through the heart chakra. It's coming through that amazing jet engine in the chest. Okay. So, you know, again, when we're dealing with starving empaths, we can attempt to repair our relationship with them. Generally, our relationships become fractured with starving empaths because they push us. You know, and a, a lot of people, a borderline personality disorder is huge and they will push and push and push to see if you will love them back. And then when you do, they'll take it for a while. Then they push you away again to see if you come back. And it's this yo-yo of unpredictability. A lot of times borderline people have had heavy traumas as young people. And they are massive empaths who have who are starving. They don't know how to feed themselves. So they rage and rage. Then they start to starve and they cry and cry. And here comes the compassion or here comes the fights. I mean, they, they are so a lot of times broken or severed on the inside uh, emotionally from awful things that have happened. Abandonment, sexual abuse. I mean, it goes on and on. Just abuse, abuse, having parents who completely ignored you. So when we have relationships with people, regardless of what their deal is, maybe they actually are a clinical narcissist. Maybe they are clinically borderline. Yet more often than not in America, I'm just seeing starving empaths acting like a-holes everywhere. That's what I'm seeing. And pushing people away and getting into fights and having meltdowns and pouting and demanding and being a martyr and all these things because their heart chakras are just trying to feel some sort of connection. So if you have a family member that's a starving empath, um, you know, I, I would really like to talk about that because we there's ways we can repair or at least try to. We can only do, remember people, we can only do our 100% of the 50% of a relationship that we have to work with. So just remember that. Yet if we have family members that are challenging, maybe they're a starving empath, and here's a great example of a starving empath, okay? So you're texting with a friend and you get busy and you can't text them back in time. And then the next day goes by or whatever. And then you get the, what did I do? Did I make you mad? Are you mad at me? Is everything okay? Are you okay? Oh my God. And the desperate, like the crazy one text after the other text. I mean, that's different than just saying, hey girl, are you okay? I mean, like the crazy text of, I knew you were mad at me and oh no, what can I do? And well, that's fine. If you're not going to answer me, that's just fine. And oh my God, I wish texting had never been invented. I cannot believe the propensity to be butthurt that human beings have. It, we have, we have really fallen in, we have fallen into such a pit of, of self-woe because many empaths are starving and we just don't know how to legitimately connect with anybody anymore. It's, it's, 
it's out of control. So if you have a family member or friend or whatever like that, that you really value and love, um, that hasn't worn you out yet, then you being able to just reach out to them and say, yes, everything is fantastic. I just got busy. I love you. How are you? And, you know, you're confirming that you love that person. You're putting the fire out of fear. It's not our responsibility to tell people that we're somebody we're not. But, you know, just if you love that person, just put their mind at rest and asking, how are you? You know, it it creates a bridge and you're engaging them on a positive and you are connecting with them on a positive, not on a negative. So you're literally training people how to connect in a non-chaotic, non, oh my God, the world's going to end histrionic sort of way. So then the person might write back and say, oh my God, I'm so glad that you, I'm so glad that you weren't mad at me because I was sure that you weren't mad at me. And oh my God, I can stand it when you're mad at me. The way to retrain a starving empath is to not engage the drama. Do not engage the drama. Please leave all drama at the door. Drama can be harmful. Drama has been known to ruin relationships. Please, when engaging drama, do so carefully. Actually, just don't do it. Uh, Because, you know, if your person sends you a text back that way, then, you know, obviously you want to acknowledge what they said, but if it's just like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, writing back and saying, you sound like you're under a great deal of stress today. I love you. I hope you're well. And you're just putting it right back on them because again, you are showing them, you know, you sound like you are under stress. I love you. I hope you're well. Now that's not really going to solve the problem of them trying to be like, you know, oh my God, I'm here's me. They got a little of attention out of it, but you didn't go on and on. You didn't get into the two hour text conversation of how their dog ate their homework and they have an ingrown butt hair and whatever else it is, some drama or negativity that they need in order to connect with somebody. And in our American culture, we have martyred ourselves horribly because we are empaths that want positive connection, yet we're not sure how to ask for it. Yet it's okay to admit our grand suffering, um, especially if we, if we victimize ourselves. So a big favorite for people is to really get a starving. The biggest time you can see an empath starving, you know, when people get onto massive money rants and all they talk about, not just, I mean, everybody gets on a money rant now and again, you guys, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people. Have you ever known people in your life and all they do is talk about how broke they are, how poor they are, poor them. It's called poor mouthing. And they go on and on and on about all this stuff. They're never going to have enough money for anything. And, oh, my God, I I would go there with you, but I just don't have the money. And it's the martyring exercise through really basically showing a a glass of limitation. And, And that's probably true. I mean, they probably are working hard and are broke, okay? Yet at the same time, the person who hits that over and over and, oh, poor me, and I don't have any money, and look at my money, and I'm broke, and I'm broke, and I'm broke, and I'm broke, they are looking for somebody to come in and say, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. You don't deserve that. Let me buy this for you. Let me do this for you. They don't even want the stuff. They want the energy behind the stuff. They want that connection. So if we have those friends who get into those cycles then saying, geez, you know, I'm really sorry you're going through such a tough time. You know, you could just come over to my house and we could sit here and just have whatever I have in the fridge if you'd like. And generally that's going to get you, well, I would, but I can't afford the gas because, you know, actually I can't even afford to walk out my front door because it's going to take some soles off my shoes, which might mean I have to buy a pair later. And well, really that means, you know, I can't afford to open my door because that means I have to buy oil for the hinges And actually, I can't even walk to my door because if I put any stress on my wood floor, it's going to mean I have to buy some nails later. So thanks for inviting me over, but I can't. Okay. And again, you know, if you just don't engage it and you say, wow, okay, we'll rock on, you know, we'll catch up with you when things are going a little better, sending you love. You know, when people who are starving empaths recognize that some of the mechanisms of martyrdom, of bullying, of narcissism, of hypochondria, when they recognize that these mechanisms no longer get them the attention they need, 
then they're going to start to connect with people in a different way. They're going to start to step up and connect outside of themselves. Ways that I have assisted starving empaths to really find their center and to really engage with themselves and to have that self-confidence because starving empaths are generally really powerful empathetic beings. They are powerful empaths. They have huge spiritual gifts and talents. They just might have gotten kicked by life one too many times in the side of the temple, so to speak, and they've got no motivation. They've they've lost their, you know, how how many of us, if all you are getting are, are just hard blows to the chest, so to speak, and it's money problems all the time or health problems all the time, you know, it's a rare person and it's, and I see them more and more anymore, but it's a rare person who can hold their bubble between the lines And not just become the illness or become the situation or become the issue with themselves. And whenever we become our issue, that's a starving empath. It's because we don't know how to connect. We don't know how to receive any sort of connection outside of our identity of the suffered person. I mean, even in the president, God, his favorite thing is to martyr himself. I mean, he is a classic starving empath. It's so weird to look at. I just want to write him a letter and say, Dear Donald Trump, all this letter has in it for you today is love. Not for your business, not for what you've done, not for what you could do, not for the women you've slept with, not for this or not for that. Just because you're a fellow human being on the earth. And I know you don't feel like anybody actually sees you because you don't even let you out because you buried you when you were seven. So please give your seven-year-old my love because, man, that's got to be tough to have to fake it every day of being the president when all you want is is just to be accepted and loved. Probably not going to send that letter, but I just did through the ethers, you know. So the reason I'm talking about starving empaths today, gang, is because so many of us get wounded when we are on the other end of cruel narcissistic behavior. So many of us don't understand why the hypochondriac will throw us under the bus as long as they can stay sick. So many of us don't understand why our presence in someone's life isn't enough. And it's because the empathic mechanism And what would allow that person to throw their heart open and make those deep chest connections like they should be doing that would make them happy, those connections have been damaged in those folks. And we can't always fix them. Yet let's not do the starving empaths any more damage. Let's not kick a person when they're down. You know, we can walk away. We cannot engage it. We can make sure that we're not in the fire hose of crap coming out of somebody's starving, desperate moment. Yet, gang, if we wound and wound and wound back the starving empath, it feeds them and it fuels them and they just keep going on one hand. On the other hand, it is devastating the person in there who recognizes that this addiction toward chaos is debilitating them. And inside of every starving empath is a person in there crying and suffering and frightened and terrified and and just hating themselves. I mean, it's awful. So again, we can't save everybody, yet we also don't need to become part of the problem. Walk the heck away and let it go with love. And if somebody's going at you like crazy, Just make a comment that's uplifting and disengage. And you can show that person that there is something beyond the rage to feed them. And they may not get it at first, but that little four and five and seven-year-old inside of them is going to run right to the front and grab it and be like, oh my God, I got this. This is awesome. You know, it's really interesting with our president because you look at presidents And they don't get to be who they are. That's not the job. If you are the president of the United States, the job dictates that you must transcend whoever you are to become a way more hollow vessel to be able to stand in stewardship for all. And you're not the most powerful person in the world. That's such an old 
imbalanced, patriarchal, weirdo thing to say. Yet you are the most powerful person in the executive branch of government. You're not even the most powerful person in the government. Okay, right now that would be Mitch McConnell. That's the Senate Majority Leader. So you're just, you are, you are the most powerful person in the executive branch. That's it. Yet your job is to not be everything about you. Your job is to stand in a place of stewardship and your stuff goes right out the window because the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And what's fascinating is we've had presidents who could do that. You know, I, I got to say, George W. Bush, old W., he was certainly not my favorite president, um, but boy, I'd take him 25 times over right now. I would go give him a sloppy kiss on the cheek and hand him a hot dog if he was president right now. Good Lord. It's interesting what perspective does for a person. However, Bush, W, is a massive empath. And he would, you know, get in there and do his cowboy John Wayne thing and talk about this and talk about that and blah, blah. And then the Twin Towers fell down. And that man, through his empathic heart, wide, wide open. And he realized that he could no longer be the caricature that he placed forward that protected him in the presidency, that he had to be the steward of all people. And, you know, there's that classic footage of W. And he was reading a book to some kindergarten kids. And they gave him a note that basically said, hey, guess what? We have a terrorist attack. The Twin Towers fell down, blah. And you watch him read that note and fold it up. And you watch his face. And you watch him return to what he's doing. And then he goes off to do what he's doing. And then when he gets to ground zero... You know, that man's empathy just soared and he had tears in his eyes and he's crawling up on the rubble and he's, you know, somebody said in the back, you know, something, can you hear me? One of the firefighters as he was delivering his speech through the bullhorn, uh, 9-11 at the ground zero. And he says, yes, I can hear you. We can all hear you. And it was this moment. I'm getting goosebumps right now. And he, you have to understand who I was back then when he was president. I did not like him at all. I was all fired up about all these political issues and, er, you know, and I still actually believed back then that the Democratic Party and the Republican Party were, had, had different interests for the country. And now I'm, now I can actually see that it's, it's all kind of the same old wash here. Yeah, you know, I was on Team Democrat back in the day, and it was a big deal. But I watched him say that, and I thought, you know what, mister? I, okay. You know what? My heart chakra flew wide open when I heard him say that. And I was just like, my God. Yeah, you're a human being, and I get you, and I get that. And George Bush is actually, he's a cancer. So he's, you know, that's a home and hearth and all these other kinds of things. Donald Trump is a Gemini which if not nurtured or aspected in youth can become very, um, whew, can, get, can get tough. So, you know, this is just different ways that empath, and actually George W. wasn't a starving empath. He was an empath that fed himself regularly with things that he liked. And I'm sure he had lots of different things in his life he didn't like, and there were lots of things, like I said, that I didn't agree with. However, the difference between an empath who feeds himself, George W. Bush, and an empath who does not feed himself, Donald Trump, is night and freaking day. It is unbelievable. Two Republican presidents, two presidents, I probably, well, I didn't vote for either one. However, one of them, I completely all of a sudden saw as a human being and thought, wow, man, okay, I got to cut you a little slack here. Another one I look at and all I want to do is rescue him out of the White House and send him back to fourth grade and let everybody love on him because he's not even anywhere in the position to handle this because he's not just a starving empath. He's an anorexic empath. I mean, that poor man is, is just emaciated on the inside emotionally. And so, you know, we can beat up our starving empaths all we want, but it's not going to help them. It's not going to help the situation. And what we can do is balance the situation by putting love in the world. And by being loving and disengaging from the chaos and understanding that we don't need to make it all about us either. Sometimes somebody's just having a tough time. So for all you empaths out there, let's try to figure out, let's not put ourselves in harm's way, of course. I never want anybody to do that emotionally. Yet let's understand the difference between a clinical narcissist 
and somebody who might just be getting pinned against the wall at the Piggly Wiggly. And we might be able to talk with that person about how to just roll to the right about two feet and get out of that string. They may not do it, but at least we tried. All right, everybody, let us all go pour love into the world. And I will see you next week. 